This podcast, Visceral, is a production of the GI Research Foundation. The GI Research Foundation was able to produce this podcast with a sponsorship from AbbVie. So I think one thing that I've noticed in being a specialist in lower motility is you're not alone and there are people who can help you. Welcome to another episode of Visceral, the podcast from the GI Research Foundation. My name is Anna Gomberg, and I'm here today with Lalitha Sitaraman. She is the new assistant professor of medicine and gastroenterology at the University of Chicago Medicine. And her primary focus is motility disorders and neurogastroenterology. These are conditions which focus on the disordered connection between the nervous system and digestive tract or conditions of disordered muscle control and movement. Dr. Sitaraman specializes in diagnosing and treating gut, brain, and motility disorders, specifically in the lower GI tract and pelvic floor. So welcome, Dr. Sitaraman. We're so excited to have you here and with us at the University of Chicago. I want to just start with just a few open questions about Motility disorders in general, because we haven't really talked about this in any of our settings, um, including this podcast, because we haven't really had someone with your expertise who's been part of our center. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about what gut motility is and how it affects the digestive system? Sure. Uh, First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to do this podcast. I'm looking forward to sharing my expertise with you. So in a general sense, gut motility is essentially the coordination of movement of the muscles within the GI tract. And each section of the GI tract has slightly different movement patterns. So your esophagus is a little bit different than your stomach, which is a little bit different than your small intestine or colon, and also different from the anus and rectum. So when we're kind of, we kind of split them up into those different segments. And, you know, when you become a motility specialist, uh, most people do an additional training for that after doing gastroenterology fellowship. And so I did additional training. And so I do treat primarily the colon and anorectum now, but I have been trained in the entire GI tract um, to evaluate those disorders. So why is motility important and how does it um, affect people's digestion? Sure. So um, essentially, motility is how things move. So if you eat something, you have to be able to swallow it. And so in the upper GI tract, being able to swallow, being able to have your stomach pulverize the food and move it through the stomach, being able to absorb nutrients through the small intestine, and then eventually being able to evacuate the byproducts of digestion, uh, so stool, um, all of that, you know, is essential to being able to function as a human being, absorb nutrients and get rid of waste. So, um, you know, when I think, you know, best studied or the esophagus and the anal rectum, um, partly because there are the majority of diseases in those realms that we know about. And also it's easier to study because they're towards the outside of the body. Mm, So, um, Yeah. So the testing that we do, you know, we're able to check the esophagus with various maneuvers. We're able to check the anal rectum with various maneuvers um, and um, testing that way. So start to finish, how long does it take food to go from your mouth all the way out? In, in In a person, when things are going well, how long does that usually take? Sure. That takes generally between 12 and 24 hours. It's a kind of a big range. Is there a yes. lot? Is that is this, and there is are it? certainly some people whose colons take longer. So I mean, I think people will often say, "Well, if I didn't have my bowel movement this morning, that means that I'm constipated and it's going to be a bad day or something." Um, and you know, not everyone has a daily bowel movement. A lot of people do, um, and some people have multiple in a day. Some people have one every three days, and that can be normal for you. Um, so I mean, we the d- gut transit time when we have when we say that something is normal versus abnormal. Um, Generally speaking, it's anywhere from 12 to 24 hours from in your mouth to being out. So is constipation a motility disorder or is it a combination of factors that that influence that or where does that fall in the spectrum? So short answer is yes. Um, (laughs) So I mean, essentially constipation can be a a transit issue with a slow large intestine, Um, but constipation can also be a muscle coordination issue of movement in the anus and rectum that, you know, if you're straining and you're not able to pass the stool, then there can be backup and then infrequent bowel movements, struggling to have a bowel movement. Um, 
And then also uh, there are other effects that we are learning about more with constipation, especially in neurogastroenterology is like the association with irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome or IBS can be associated with diarrhea, constipation, or both. And those like the neuron connections, the brain connection with the gut brain axis can actually also influence bowel habits. Interesting. So, can you say a little more about that? How does that work? Uh, so it's really complicated, which is <laughs> kind of like, no, right fun. <laughs> no, this is, it's actually, I mean, this is where, this is the exciting stuff. Yeah. So, you know, we're learning a lot about disorders of gut brain interaction. Um, we're learning a lot about the gut brain, inter, uh, the gut brain axis in a general sense. Um, and it's, it's full of a lot of different factors. So it's, there's hormonal factors, not only, um, things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and, but also hormones like stress hormones like cortisol. Oh, sure. We're learning those effects on the gut. We're learning the effects of neurotransmitters on the gut, like serotonin, dopamine, neurogenergics, all those things that are in your brain that also work on those, that work with those brain nerves. Um, and then when there's imbalances in those things, there can, you can develop disorders of gut brain interaction. So, you know, when we're trying to trying to treat these uh, these illnesses, a lot of times we're using neuromodulators. We're using things that attack the nerves that more than anything else in the gut, not necessarily if you have constipation, not necessarily using something that's like a laxative. Sometimes we have to as well. But a lot of these symptoms that are part of the disordered gut brain axis are um, treated when you target the nerves, that almost that brain half of it, that those things get better. So constipation can sometimes even be improved with just a neuromodulator. That's amazing. So wait, what are those medications that you mentioned? What are those neuromodulator med yeah, medications? So generally, those fall under the class of antidepressants, which is actually kind of interesting. But the reason that is, is because serotonin is in the GI tract. And serotonin is also like, we call it like the, the happy chemical or what you get from your runner's high or, you know, endorphins. Those are all, that's all serotonin. And most of the medications that are antidepressants are uh, affect serotonin. So there are serotonin reuptake inhibitors in one way or another to increase the amount of serotonin um, uh, that's available. So in the gut, when you, if you use those, or if you use certain other uh, similar classes of, of neuromodulators that are fall under the category of antidepressants, they can modulate pain and sometimes help with bowel movements. So how do you assess and how do you, what diagnostic tests can you use to assess a patient's motility? Um, you mentioned that it's easier to do with the, the top and the bottom of the GI tract, but what are those tests that you use to look at something like that? So in general sense, um, both of the tests that we, the main procedures that we have for assessing um, the motility is uh, for the motility of the esophagus and motility of the anus and rectum. There are a couple other things that we can do to look at the stomach emptying and um, whole gut transit. So how we talked about how it could be 12 to 24 hours for emptying, that's based on normals from some amount of testing we have with whole gut transit uh, tests, which are complicated and also one of them is being pulled from the market, unfortunately, um, but uh, not Wait, for the safety. Wait, what's being pulled from the market and the, why? The entire gut motility transit time. So there's something that's called a... It's like a motility capsule that is to measure whole gut transit time. So you swallow it, it's and then it measures how long it takes to get through the stomach, small intestine, and colon until it's out of the body. And for some reason, I think it's just not financially usable for enough that there's they're pulling it from the market, unfortunately. But there are other things we do too. So from testing with motility disorders, we're generally looking at using a tiny catheter that has a bunch of press pressure sensors on it. Mm -hmm. And um, it can measure both the strength and the timing of contractions in the esophagus or in the anus and rectum. Mm -hmm. And these are different catheters, but similar with in construction. So both of them measure with high resolution over time, measuring pressure and um, and essentially changes in pressure to tell us how strong a contraction could be. So if something is well coordinated, there should be certain amounts of contraction and pressure, increased pressure and certain amounts of relaxation allowing movement. And if those things don't happen the way that they're supposed to, then that's when you get a disorder of swallowing or that's when you get a disorder of 
defecation, trouble having a bowel movement. Um, with this testing for esophageal, you generally are swallowing liquids to watch how that movement goes. And with uh, bowel movements, uh, sorry, with uh, lower motility, you're simulating a bowel movement. So there's some amount of, you know, hold tension. And then that catheter will measure how strong the muscle is. And then it'll be like release tension. And that kind of shows how the muscle gets back to normal or relaxes enough to be able to, for you to pass, or in some people's cases, not pass any stool. This episode is brought to you by AbbVie. AbbVie's mission is to discover and deliver innovative medicines that solve serious health issues today and address the medical challenges of tomorrow. We strive to have a remarkable impact on people's lives across several key therapeutic areas. For more information about AbbVie, please visit us at www.abvie.com. Follow AbbVie on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. It sounds like this is a lot of muscle work. Are there is there physical therapy that can be applied for some of these disorders? I know that your work sometimes focuses on the pelvic floor, but I was just curious to know. Um, and even from the esophageal end, is there is that a is that something that people can work on or can get? Because of course, these are muscles we don't have conscious control over. Right. So the esophagus is actually completely involuntary. So there, unfortunately, is nothing you can do to do physical therapy for the esophagus. Um, and that swallowing component is because of the types of muscles there are, that nerve control is just out of your control completely. Now, pelvic floor therapy is not just, you know, for strengthening the pelvic floor. There is also pelvic floor therapy for relaxing the pelvic floor. So the interesting thing about the anus and the anal rectum is that that can be a learned behavior of not actually being able to defecate properly. So expelling stool is a very, very coordinated movement of generating enough force to be able to pass stool and relaxing enough to allow stool to pass. So being able to have both coordination of contraction and force generation and the same time that there's generation of force, relaxation of force, that actually can be relearned. And that is actually something that is, we think is, is something that starts when people have chronic constipation and develop a disorder of coordination in the anus and rectum, that some of that is a learned behavior. Some of the ways that people have been dealing with having constipation is they've relearned how to have a bowel movement the wrong way. So pelvic floor therapy, we call it pelvic floor therapy with biofeedback. There's a way to essentially for you to see what you are doing when you are trying to simulate a bowel movement with a small sensor that's usually placed in the body. And it will show you why you, in a sense, like when you are contracting too much or when you're not contracting enough. And it's really, really helpful for a lot of our patients who have issues with constipation and passing bowel movements for them to be able to have successful defecation. Um, the other thing that's really that's nice amazing. about this is that's that incredible. It, it works. So it's a visualization of that contraction cycle or or system that they can see, that someone can see while they're in real time or in... Yes. Wow, so it's in real amazing. time. So there's two different ways that this is often provided. One is with either colors. So a little light will show you if you're increasing or decreasing pressure or a tracing. So you'll see a little line and the line will go up or down with the amount of muscle contraction or relaxation that's occurring. That's incredible. Wow. Um, that's so interesting. And and what are, so that you mentioned these, these ways that this can go awry, that gut motility can go awry. Are there specific disorders that gut motility is a function of or is related to? Um, you've mentioned IBS and IBD. I think another way to ask that question is how are they, how is gut motility related to those, um, to both functional bowel disorders and inflammatory conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? So motility disorders are, I would say, probably not super implicated in inflammatory bowel disease. So I, so Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, there can be overlap of those with you know other disorders of gut brain interaction, and those are extremely extremely complex. But I think more when we're talking about issues with 
muscle coordination, motility in the in the entire gut, um, there's more overlap with disorders of brain interaction because those are throughout the entire gut system. The nerves are everywhere. Um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease has certainly some processes of how it forms that we think could even overlap with irritable bowel syndrome. No, of course. We completely know that there's so much overlap between IBD and IBS. Um, and I don't just mean the, the overlap of people not knowing which one they have and, and the misnomer, which happens all the time, but literally IBS and IBD having both things at the same time. Um, so of course it would seem to me that then in that way, gut motility would come into play. Right. And it could be that there's some elements of, you know, the microbiome. So different uh, bacteria in the gut is say that there's stasis from poor motility. Could that be a reason that people develop IBS or IBD? We don't know. So there's a lot of um, the mechanism behind a, any motility disorder other than congenital, like literally from birth problems that we know about, we really don't have a great sense of why these things happen. Um, there is um, kind of an interesting uh, parasite that can create problems with the motility in the esophagus. And some people are studying what? that parasite. Well, tell me more about that. Yeah, That's amazing. So, like a parasite that people pick up uh, in South America usually. So it's called it's called Chagas disease. And so this type of this parasite um that causes Chagas disease can cause electrical problems in the heart. So it can cause complete heart block, so affecting the electricity in the heart and potentially by a similar mechanism can cause problems with motility in the esophagus and create what we call a mega esophagus. So the esophagus stops working. And that we're wondering is that, could that be a target for trying to understand maybe what happens in some of these more intrinsic conditions, such as achalasia, where the esophageal sphincter doesn't relax. And then, or, or, um, or, or could it be something in like, uh, you know, sclerotic disorders like lupus, systemic sclerosis, mm -hmm. could there be some some target then for treatment maybe even mm -hmm. to understand what we could do about the esophagus? That's fascinating. Wow. That's really amazing. So, and, and that is such an interesting path for research to take in studying something like a parasitic infection or a, paras a parasite. You can be then developing new ideas about some of these other yeah the basics really of where it comes very from very difficult and yeah. how you could treat it potentially so you mentioned that many of these disorders are congenital is that so that would mean that they start from childhood is that true do we see mo a lot of pediatric patients with motility disorders um and did that continue through adulthood so the ones that we know that happen um and we know why they're happening are congenital the majority of motility disorders we actually don't know why they happen you know, and that's mm. where that the, the trying to find the origin of disorders gut brain interaction, trying to find the origin of the of like chronic constipation difficulty dis disorders. We're all learning so much about that now. Um, so you know, as a as like, does early life trauma lead to difficulty disorders and IBS? Yes, we know that there's interaction there. Could PTSD also be associated with IBS? Yes, it could be. And is that evidence of trauma? Is that something that is a cause? Maybe, you know, and like, and then how do we, how do we promote resilience to ha have people not get affected with IBS after having a traumatic event, which could be, you know, anything from a car accident to, you know, being in a war or something like all of those things can, cr yeah. can create trauma. And certainly the long-term effects of living with some of these disorders. We, we know from talking with Dr. Bedell and other RGI psychologists that the sort of cycle of how these things interact um, over time is also really something that is, uh, I know, to be studied and of real paramount importance as people live their lives. Um, when should a patient see you or see another gastroenterologist if they think they might be having difficulty with their gut motility? So I just to harken back to one little thing, I want to just make sure we say that most people do not have motility disorders. Most people do not. And congenital disorders of motility are very rare. So most people don't have those issues. Um, and most people are not born with the motility disorder. The times that you want to be worried are if you are having trouble swallowing 
and you're having the sensation of food or medication being stuck in your throat or chest, and it's becoming progressive or persistent, that is a time when you should see a gastroenterologist or at least, you know, talk to your primary care provider about, is this something that needs to be evaluated further? And that would be, I think, like that's a, you know, one segment of your GI tract. The other half, which is the lower half, if you are having constipation that is new, so you've never had constipation before, and all of a sudden it's like really becoming difficult to have a bowel movement, if you notice there's any like blood in your stool, if you're noticing that you are feeling very uncomfortable a lot of the time, having a lot of belly pain, that may be something that also needs to be investigated sooner rather than later. First with your primary care provider can address some of the basics of that, maybe start that workup, do that referral for a gastroenterologist for you. But constipation is also very, very common. And constipation is not necessarily always a motility disorder. And that is absolutely, um, we, we talk about constipation at our patient support group for patients with IBD quite frequently for a disorder that is much more manifest in terms of diarrhea. Um, but we still talk about, um, especially because of the medical interventions, how constipation can be caused by lots of different things. Um, and patients coming to figure out their body's rhythms is really a big part of that process. I have a question related to that support group, which is a lot of our patients with IBD report kind of rapid transit issues where um, particularly post-surgical, they have um, they, they feel like they eat food and it goes right through them. Is that something to do with motility? Yeah, I would say yes. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it's a little hard. Rapid transit is challenging because of why it might happen. So when someone who mm. has had gut surgery, each segment of your small intestine and each segment of your large intestine are doing a job. So if that area is removed, the rest of the gut has to figure it out. The good thing is the gut's pretty <laughs> smart in a way. I, I mean, I think it's pretty smart. Um, and it figures <laughs> it out. So if you have most of your colon removed, whatever is a remnant of your colon can oftentimes pick up all the water that needs to be picked up out of that small intestinal fluid and small intestinal products. Um, and then you can have a solid stool. But if you have a lot of your small intestine removed, then a lot of times there's not enough, there might not be enough time to absorb things. There may not be enough of an adjustment yet post-surgically for someone to have a normal transit time. But rapid transit is a problem for people post-surgical, people who've had bariatric surgery and have a gastric bypass. Those people can also have rapid transit and those mechanisms are slightly different most of the time. One of those things can be if there's like too much sugar or too much, um, we call it osmotic load. So anything that has a lot of, uh, uh, usually it's sugar or fake sugar, those things can go right through you because those are not able to be absorbed immediately. Um, and the places that they need to be absorbed are at the front part of your small intestine. Um, and other things are absorbed in different areas, other nutrients, proteins, fats, they're broken down in different areas and they're absorbed in different areas. Vitamins are absorbed in different areas. Um, and then water is absorbed mostly in the colon. So if you don't have enough time, to get, then it's going to be diarrhea. And potentially malabsorption, which is something that people worry a lot about Correct. with some of these post-surgical or inflammatory conditions. Um, that is very instructive and very helpful. So if there was something that you would want to tell patients who might be concerned about constipation or esophageal symptoms, what, what would be one thing that you would want to tell patients um, as a big takeaway regarding gut motility or just advice that you have for them as a gastroenterologist um, who specializes in these disorders? So I think one thing that I've noticed in being a specialist in lower motility, I'm going to speak to that mostly, is you're not alone and there are people who can help you. I think a lot of the patients that I see have had constipation for 10, 15, 20 years, and they've learned to accept it. It's just their way of life. They know they're going to spend half an hour, 45 minutes on the toilet. They're probably only going to go once a week. And that's what they've become accustomed to. And that doesn't have to be normal. It might be, you know, something that is manageable. And so I would say if it's something you've been 
noticing for a long time and you find it bothersome or distressing, don't hesitate to see a gastroenterologist because we have things we can do and we're getting better about understanding the process, understanding the causes, understanding the you know, root causes as well as addressing treatments for disorders of gut brain interaction and for constipation. Absolutely. That is, I mean, I think that that's the advice that we, I, you know, I hear time and again from many of our gastroenterologists is you don't have to live like this and that we have, we, we want to help you get better. And it's great to know that in this new domain for our digestive diseases center, um, with your expertise, we're even getting a little bit, we're getting even closer to that. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast Visceral from the GI Research Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Anna Gombert, and edited and mixed by the incredible Mike Collins Dowden, who also composed our theme music. We hope you will join us next time. Until then, to access other podcasts and learn more about research to treat, prevent, and cure digestive diseases, as well as access additional educational materials, please visit the website at giresearchfoundation.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you again to Abby for making this podcast possible.